Most of you, I think, know me. Um, some of you don't. I'm Colin Dixon. I'm the chair of the Technical Steering Committee. I'm a distinguished engineer at Brocade. I also run the Open Daylight Documentation Project. And if those three things seem incongruent, um, ask Chris Price. Um, uh, so um, I, I, this is going to be really interactive. It's a small group. Just yell at me. Um, if you don't have any vegetables, uh, uh, it's probably fine. And even if you do, I'm probably good at dodging. I'm not going to promise George Bush levels, but I'll come close. Um, so I'm going to go through um, the history of Open Daylight documentation, uh, a little bit of how we do docs in Open Daylight. Um, uh, major changes we made in Boron. I think Boron is the most interesting release for documentation we've had, full stop. Um, not, not, not since something, but just full stop. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I'd like to see us do in the future, um, and then I'll talk about how you can help, because that's the biggest thing. Um, and we'll get to that. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, open daylight his, uh, um, history. Uh, for hydrogen, uh, we literally had a wiki page. Um, and it was the hydrogen base user guide. And you already, we had distributions, we had a base, a service provider, and like a network virtualization or something like that. I forget what the, what's the third one, was that it? Yeah. Was it network base and service provider? By the way, that was a terrible idea and nobody used them. Um, uh, we, we, we fixed that. Um, but it was literally like a wiki, and you can, if you squint, you can read the topics. Um, uh, but uh, it was basically just a skeleton that pointed to other wiki documents that were probably out of date before hydrogen was developed and started. Um, uh, so for helium, lithium, and beryllium, we sort of moved to using, we stole um, uh, OpenStax docs at the wrong time. Uh, <laughs> uh, we stole them when they were still using Rackspace's documentation system. It was all based on ASCII doc and weird doc book extensions. And um, so there's a really complicated Maven plugin that I don't even know where the source for it lives that was donated by Inesib, which is basically the smallest possible change you could have in order to make it work. Um, and the PDFs actually work pretty well. They actually look pretty good. I think in some ways they might even be um, uh, uh, prettier than the PDFs we get today. But um, in essence, nobody could find anything. The PDFs were available as a single download on the downloads page. Search engines don't index PDFs worth a damn, despite their claims that they do. Um, and the wiki was full of out-of-date, horrible content that popped to the top of every single search. Um, so basically, um, we had reasonable content, I think. Um, there's still a way for it, but nobody could find it. And so sort of uh, with Boron, we've moved to entirely, we basically moved web first, which is like the very first thing we want to do is publish a, a publicly accessible, well-documented, easy to find place where all the documentation goes. Um, that's the number one goal. Um, and then we also generate a PDF after the fact, which you can download and play with. Um, it weighs in a nice like 989 pages or something like that. Um, uh, in case you're wondering if we had a lot of content. I mean, we do actually, we have actually produced a lot of documentation. Much of it's actually pretty decent. Um, but finding it was impossible. But it, it is literally, I think, 998 pages. I can pull it up later if people are interested. Um, but it's web first, and so you can sort of see the web page here. Um, and it's also all mobile friendly, because you can see I did this all from my tablet. You can see the giant hideous Android arrows at the bottom. Um, uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's mobile first, web first. It's sort of all of the nice, buzzy word things. It's also searchable, and, and as long as your searches are longer than three characters. But um, uh, we're, we're working on the bugs. Um, so sort of, I think I covered most of this, uh, but basically documentation has consistently been one of the two biggest pain points people complain about. Um, the first one being upgrades. Uh, um, and uh, upgrades are hard. Documentation is also hard, but it's easier than upgrades. <laughs> so we did documentation. <laughs> uh, um, and I sort of talked about this. It was, I think, it was really hard to find because search engines don't point to the PDFs. Um, the search engines point to the wiki instead. The wiki was full of horribly out-of-date information. It was basically guaranteed if you browsed to somewhere on the wiki that it was wrong. Um, and, and in some cases, it was so wrong that like you couldn't even discover it was wrong because like you couldn't find the pieces of code that you would need in order to replicate the thing which it was suggesting. Um, so it's sort of the worst thing ever. Um, uh, and then there was last complaint, which we haven't really fixed yet, but I think is still, I, not to say that we solved world hunger, just so I know, people complain that documentation is often much more of an inventory of what we've done 
than it is uh, here's what it's capable of doing or here's what you or here's how to do something with it. Um, so we do a really good job of saying there's an API call called add network. It takes you know us you know it takes an IP address and a number between zero and thirty two and like that and it puts them together into some mask. It, it doesn't even say that. It really just says sort of like, here are the fields past the thing. And so that's um, it's not quite that bad, but it's close to that. And so figuring out how to get that together is going to be interesting. Um, and I know why that's happening. I have less good reasons how to fix it, but, but the last slide is I'm going to ask for your help. I think that's the big part. Um, my personal experience, though, is that we have more good content than people give us credit for. Um, uh, in fact, I mean, and Bo is sitting in the front row getting to test. A bunch of the time he's asked me questions, I've said, you know, have you checked the NetConf user guide in the PDF? And sure enough, the exact question that he had was answered in the NetConf user guide in the PDF. Now, it was on, you know, page 357 of 485, and it was in a PDF that you had to go to the downloads page. But so it's really just hard to find. And so we focused on trying to make things easier to find in Boron. And my hope is that in make, making things easier to find, we are going to expose it to more people, more people will make it better, and we will also increase the incentives to contribute. I think for a long time in open daylight, documentation has basically been viewed as a black hole because it, it's been a black hole. People have thrown a whole bunch of documentation into it and nobody's ever seen it. And so why would you invest anything in something that nobody ever sees? Um, so, um, so basically, that brings me to my goals, which is, um, uh, uh, here are sort of the four things I came up with, um, and, and uh, they're probably not perfect, but easy to find was sort of the first goal. I think we've put that. Make it really easy for developers to contribute the documentation. I'll do a whole slide on this, but for better or for worse, um, the developers are who we've got. <laughs> uh, and so if you can't streamline it so that way they can document things when they write the code, um, it's not going to happen. I mean, I haven't seen... I haven't seen another open source project do any better, so I don't really know what the answer is, but um, there's only two ways that I've seen documentation produced in open source projects. One of them is the users write it themselves, and that's effectively what happened to OpenStack, um, but it took a long time and it's still not great, or the doc developers write it. I, and I haven't seen people fund tech writers in open source projects the way that they fund tech writers in companies. Just never seen it. I'd love to see it, just haven't. Um, this is really key, versioning documentation per release. Um, this is kind of why the wiki failed, which is that, you know, <laughs> um, the way that we ended up producing documentation on the wiki was that you create like a landing page and then it did what wikis do, which is point to a whole bunch of pages off to the side, which is sort of what was right. And they were right when you linked to them. <laughs> um, but then you were like, oh, but in the, hydrogen, in the helium release, we changed this variable to be a 32-bit number instead of a 16-bit number. So let me update it here. But you've inadvertently updated the hydrogen documentation at the same time. And so you actually need to keep these things separate, which it really needs to be code. You really need to manage it as code alongside your um, uh, different releases. And this has actually been, uh, otherwise, I think the wiki actually would have been almost the ideal format um, for this last reason, which is easy ways to get feedback or let people edit things. like. Um, let me tell you that the thing which pisses me off the most about our current documentation is um, you can see it, you can poke at it, and you can see that the word there is the wrong there, and it needs an apostrophe RE instead of you know, an IR, and you can't fix it unless you go clone the documentation repo, install git review, um, open the right file, change it, it, you know, create an open daylight key, um, right? Like, like, the, like the difference between somebody who's reading something that could have fixed a spelling error and being able to submit the documentation, like it's just ridiculous how far, how, how much effort you're gonna make somebody go through. Um, so that's the thing which I, I really like to fix that. Um, there are some cool ideas about how to fix that, but um, none of them are obvious. Um, it's more difficult if your company blocks the Jira port too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we've, do we finally fix that? <laughs> I, I should just force myself to not use the Garrett port for like a week. And, I, mean, I, should, I should take Ton, I should ask Ton to block the Garrett port on his home router. The problem will be fixed in a day, <laughs> everywhere. Um, so, um, all right, so PDFs are basically really terrible at having things that are easy to find. Um, tech writer tools are incredibly bad at getting developers to contribute. Um, nothing makes developers hate you more than like telling them that you have to use like you know weird doc book editing tools that are proprietary and don't make any sense. Um, I've tried. They're also really expensive. Like I, I found out how much we pay per seat at Brocade for documentation tools, and and ask me afterwards. I don't want to like. I, I, you could figure out who it is that we're paying and how much they're paying, and I'd rather not. But like it's ridiculous. Um, wikis are really terrible at clobbering things. Um, we're really still working on how to get good feedback from people. 
Um, so uh, how do we actually do the documentation? Um, so the first question you might ask, who, who writes it? And, and the answer is um, uh, the people who write the code. Uh, the, the good part about that is that they're the people we have and the people who actually did the work. They're who actually knows the answers, right? Like you couldn't produce the documentation without talking to them. So they are necessary to produce the documentation. It would be convenient if they were also sufficient, uh, um, but that is not usually the case. Um, the bad is they really, uh, I guess the slides, are, the slides are more polite than I'm gonna be. They don't understand what people want to do. <laughs> Almost never do developers understand what people want to do with their code. Um, it, it, it happens. Um, and they aren't always the best at writing. Um, and this is true for two different reasons. The, the classical reason why a developer written documentation is bad is the perspective problem. Yes, amen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It seemed perfectly clear to them when they wrote it. Yeah, that's well, partially addressed by the first point, but the overlying problem is you know, the perspective. So, so, so David Carr, who's in the second row or third row, just basically said that the fundamental problem when the developers write documentation is the perspective problem, which is that they just they think about the world, and it's not just that that you know, and it's deeper than it's incredibly familiar to them and it's not incredibly familiar to other people, which is, but that, that's definitely true, but it's deeper than that, which is to say that they think about the world in a different way than the people who are gonna use it do. And hard problems for them are, are not hard problems for users and, and hard problems for users are not hard problems for them. So the whole thing just sort of ends up upside down. Um, uh, the second part is just um, most developers aren't very good writers. Um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a capable writer, but, but I, I, most develop, I, even I am not as good as the tech writers that we have, and most developers are worse. And in open source, you also end up hitting the language barrier, which is that um, we, a lot of our really good developers just don't have, you know, don't write in English. That's not their first language. Um, I've learned all kinds of peculiarities about the grammar of various languages um, by virtue of how they write English. Um, articles, it turns out, are really weird. <laughs> Uh, they are just wrong everywhere in the documentation written by other people. Um, uh, a very, very small amount of documentation in Open Daylight is produced by you know, the documentation team. I and mean, every time you hear the documentation team, you should think Colin. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I use it because I, would li I aspire to that not being true, <laughs> but so far I haven't succeeded. Um, uh, so, um, or, or tech writers. I mean, so we've had some luck in that basically we've had tech writers actually write things. So um, Denise Walters wrote a whole bunch of really good stuff for the Getting Started Guide last time, and really amazing stuff. I mean, got the Getting Started Guide into a place where it is that, you know, um, Bo's complaint that it's horribly named aside, it's fan it really is fantastic, fantastically better than what we had before. And it's good at saying, how do you get it installed and what, what are sort of your options? The next level of detail is sort of, you know, the next thing. But this is really like, I think there's like, I remember I said like 998 pages. That's like 20 pages. So you're talking like like you know two percent of our documentation is produced by professional writers. Um, so when does it get written? Um, if you went to the talk that I was supposed to be giving, um, <laughs> but instead Ann and Tan gave, um, it's due to the M3 milestone, the M5 milestone, which you can sort of roughly think is the halfway point in the finish line. Um, uh, when we do our releases, the halfway point we ask for an outline. Um, in theory, the outline should contain like the major topics you want to cover. In practice, what it serves is is to prove to make the project prove that they know that there is a documentation repository, that they, <laughs> that, they, that, they, that, that they know how to check code into it, um, and and that's about it. Um, and that and that eventually they might be asked in order to do it at the final level. And now that's not to discount how useful that is. Just to be clear, uh, it's just to be honest about what happens. And then basically, M five, you're just have the final document only change, minor changes are after that. In practice, sort of doing this, you know, in practice, having some deadline just means you eventually get some documentation if you beat people. Um, uh, but, you know, and then we accept documentation continuously, right? Docs has no risk to breaking the code. So, like, you know, we always are updating the documentation. Um, um, and actually, it's better than it was. It used to be that it was always updating the documentation in the sense that Colin would upload the PDF. Or actually, Colin would email Phil, who would then send it to the web team, who would then update the Drupal page with the PDF, um, to, uh, um, to basically it's now literally pushed. It's a CI CD um, style push of the docs. When there's a commit, it pushes, and it's live. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, uh, <laughs> so, 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 so who edits the documentation? Um, uh, it, it, 
I, I'm not, when I said the documentation team replaced it with Colin, I think I have literally, uh, to like a 1% approximation, edited every single word and been the only person who edited every single word of documentation since lithium. Um, uh, it matters and somebody needs to do it and nobody else was stepping up, so I did it. Um, I would really like more people. Um, and, and actually it got worse in between um, helium and lithium uh, because essentially brocade had actually, brocade actually saw value in having um, uh, documentation people, like real documentation people that we employed upstream until um, I hit another caveat, which is basically that we had our own internal documentation system and they realized there was no way to really actually share documentation between the two systems, at which point all of my, all of my tech writers got taken away from me upstream. Um, so that's a whole other conversation to have. Um, I suspect that there's a, a, there could be a Linux Foundation project around basically professional documentation tools for, um, uh, for enterprises because um, the documentation tools we use are abysmal. <laughs> and, like, and, and they're basically where, I mean, everybody, nobody used Linux 10 years ago. Now you, like, you'd be shot if you didn't. Um, we're going there with docs, um, and I've learned that. Anyway, that's a whole, whole aside. But there actually is sort of an ecosystem problem in documentation, which is that because the way that the open source community produces documentation is so different from the way companies produce documentation in tools, in who does it, in processes, you can't get the investment in documentation upstream from companies the way that you can get investment in developers upstream. Developers internally and externally actually, like, you know, you think you're different from the, the corporate developers, you have no idea how much more different writing is in the two places. Like you're basically the same thing between an open source developer and a company developer compared to how documentation is different. Um, so generally speaking, the process goes something like this. Project submit a documentation patch, a docs committer, which is usually me, um, does one of the following things, minus ones it, and basically says, this is, here are some things to fix. Um, or depending on how close to the release, I just download it and make the edits that I think are appropriate and I post it back and I say plus one this and I'll merge it. Or if it's list flow mapping, I just merge it. Um, <laughs> uh, seriously, there are some projects that are really, really good at this. Like, like all the complaining aside, like list flow mapping just generates spectacular documentation consistently every single time. Like uh, I barely read it at this point because it's just always good. Um, so like there are projects that are doing this right um, and we do have some really, really good stuff. Um, and then there's, I have like a find bad words script, which instead of searching for four letter words, searches for things like the name of last release, um, the number of different ways that I've discovered that people will capitalize and space open daylight, even in open daylight documentation is pretty impressive. Uh, I would think that that would be the one word that we could get right. Um, uh, but anyway, so I just have, I have basically just a, a set of um, bash scripts that go through and run grep against all of our code, which is a nice part about having it all be in ASCII doc. Um, or, or um, in plain text. So um, this is sort of like how documentation works. Um, none of that stuff changed, by the way, in between like basically Helium and today. Um, the major changes that we made uh, recently moved from ASCII doc and ASCII doctor um, to using restructured text, Sphinx, and read the docs. Um, and, and the really short reason as to why we did this is it's part of Colin's um, massive crusade against bespoke components in open daylight. Um, uh, I forget, I think I remember who said it. I, I can go dig it up. There's, there's, a, there's a tech CEO who said basically, um, I hate code. I want as little of it as possible in my products. Um, uh, and I strongly, uh, strongly endorse that. I, I, I don't want to have my own crap. It just doesn't work. I don't want to maintain it. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to fix its bugs. I don't want to have to keep up with other people. Um, and so basically, we're trying to use the, the, mo the most standardized, most off the shelf set of tools we could possibly find. Um, and this seems to be it in large part because this is the tool chain Python has adopted. Um, and uh, Python brought OpenStack with it. Um, and then uh, just to throw the totally other end of the pool, the Linux kernel moved to using this stack. Um, so like, um, so you have Linux kernel developers voluntarily pulling Python build tools into their tool chain. Something has gone pretty right. Because <laughs> uh, uh, they just like, I don't know if you've met Linux kernel developers, but they wouldn't let Python within 400 feet of the kernel if they could avoid it. Um, uh, 
So that's basically it. Um, it's just, otherwise it's basically just like any other lightweight sort of structured text formatting thing. It, you know, it, 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 you know, you put stars around, double stars around things to bold them. You put single stars to italics them, which is wrong because Markdown got it right, but it's a separate problem. Uh, there's, but there's sort of, you know, it's basic formatting. I'm not gonna show you the details, but if you go look at it, it's like, it takes you 10 minutes to learn. It takes you another 20 minutes to learn how to link um, between different things, but that's a, 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 you know, every language has its corners. You um, can generally figure, figure it out by staring at the screen and use the logic. Yeah, and there's good documentation for it. That's the other thing is like if you, like Sphinx basically took REST and turned it into its own, basically an extended REST and have its own sort of essentially dialect of REST, which is um, incredibly well documented in their tool. Um, and so the result is like when I, when ASCII doc blew up, and I had to Google how to fix things, I often ended up staring at the code of ASCII doc um, um, in order to figure out why it blew up. Um, when Sphinx fails, I Google the answer and it comes up in, you know, in uh, Stack Overflow and I can just go fix it, um, more or less. Uh, when the internals of Python installing its dependencies fail, I just, I hate Python, but it's a separate problem. Uh, Python just fails in random ways and, and then you ask Ton and Ton fixes it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, um, so the other really cool part about this, and this is sort of the ecosystem, and I'll give you a demo of this, is there's this thing called Read the Docs, which if you haven't ever experienced is amazing. Read the Docs is basically just a hosting environment with really targeting Sphinx. So it's, you know, the way that, um, now what, what's the name of the company that did Ruby on Rails is their hosted environment. Um, Salesforce spin out. Um, all right, anyway, it's basically, basically Read the Docs is Sphinx as a service. Like you can hand it a repository that contains a Sphinx code base, which is to say documentation. It will build it, but it actually does better than that. It builds it and then it looks for the other branches of that code base in Git and it builds those and it assumes each branch is a release. And then you can turn it on or off in the documentation so you can toggle back and forth between all of them and sort of putting them as layers on top of things, um, which is really amazing. It lets you do things like, you know, say this release is actually like deprecated or not or insecure and you can put up a big like red warning, warning, you're reading documentation for something that is that you know probably will cause your machine to be infected. Um, uh, so there are there are really so a really cool nice set of tools. Um, and just to sort of defend the choice of let's get this spoke crap out of my out of, out of my tool chain. Um, uh, um, we is really easy support. Um, we got a bootstrap theme for the HTML, and and, it had a, and and that was really easy and it looked nice. But then there was one bug in it, and we got the bug fixed in like I don't know, like five days or something like that. So like this is the advantage of like trying to pick up where other people are. And are we actually at the time I'm supposed to be done at this point? Um, I think we are, but that's okay. I'll, if you people have to leave, they have to leave. Um, so the really the key benefits here, we have a single searchable portal for OpenDLA docs. It's docs.opendelay.org, I'll show you in a second. Um, easy maintenance of documentation per release because sort of you get these links and branches are, this is what I was mentioning just before, our versions. Um, not actually related to this tool chain, but new in sort of Boron, we made it possible to import documentation directly from remote projects. So you can have the documentation, it used to be documentation lived in the docs repo and your code lived in your project repo. And you can now have your documentation live in your project repo. So when you add features, you can document them and have it appear automatically. And we still check things. Um, the build time went from about 10 minutes to one minute, which is a huge win. Um, we also got Windows support, which mostly works. Um, uh, but if you do pip install talks, assuming you can get pip installed, which I think most people, getting Python installed on your Windows machine is not that bad. You can do talks, that docs, and it builds on Windows. Um, and getting Windows support was almost impossible before. Um, I was gonna do a demo, but I can show you sort of, um, no, um, I can try and do a demo. Um, so here is, um, I can cd to fill slash git reps, and let me make my font a lot bigger. Uh, can people see that? Yes. Uh, so I can cd to uh, total that git reps docs. Um, I can do git br, and you can see that I use git review, um, but I'm also on master. Um, I can then do talks e docs, and I'll let this run for a little bit in the background, but um, this is going to, uh, I'll let that go. Um, but basically, this is this is just going to build the documentation. Um, the uh, um, at the same time, it's actually not going to come up there. I'm going to pull up a um, I know docs.opendelight.org, but this is going to be the really tiny. Um, so this is the actual documentation. It goes to stable boron by default, which is sort of 
you can see it says boron here and it says stable boron under the version. If you click this little swivel, the swivel takes you to sort of three different, you go to stable beryllium and that takes you to the beryllium and beryllium we only had the getting started guide so that's all you get. Latest takes you to sort of the carbon documentation that we're currently working on. You can also get a PDF and it will actually come download the PDF. Um, so this sort of, that swivel is basically what Read the Docs gives you. Um, if you, I'd like to make it more visible but it sort of lets you basically pan between the different versions and get what you need to get. Let's see, how are we doing? So this is going on in the background, it's writing the output. Um, uh, when this is, so it first reads everything in and then it's gonna build it. And so it's still going, but it'll be done before I'm done. Um, so this is my last slide. Um, so things that I really wanna be able to do in documentation, um, there are sort of three, three things I really, really wanna be able to do. The first one is I wanna be able to import code snippets directly from code. So now that I'm importing documentation from project repositories, there's nothing special about your Java file. <laughs> <laughs> it's just text. And there are lots of tools to basically put in special codes that say, you know, this is, you know, documentation snippet one, start, documentation one, snippet end. And you can basically cut the Java code in between those two comments out and suck it into your documentation. Um, Sphinx makes this trivial with Python. It makes it frustrating but doable with Java. <laughs> um, so, like, I'd really like to do that because then you get unit tested code. It's not out of date because that's one of the big problems you run into. Um, the second one I mentioned is I really, 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 really want to close the loop with users so people can read the docs um, um, and file a bug or edit this directly. Um, I think just like anything you can do to get the barrier out of the way there is going to help a huge amount. Um, and then I also, re we, I mean, this, last, this is all about, I'm an engineer, this is about the engineering half of docs. The content needs help in a lot of places. Um, and so if you can go read it, patches are really welcome. There's really good documentation about how to submit a patch documentation. Um, uh, so like if, you, if you're interested, you can really do it. It does even work on Windows. Um, I, I've demonstrated that. Um, and we also have a documentation meeting Tuesdays at noon Pacific and Bo in particular can tell you that we're friendly and we do help. Um, so, um, and there is, docu and then sort of the meeting is there. And I'll just flip back here. By, by the way, we always have to remind at the end of the meeting for Colin to look both ways when he crosses the street because we don't want him to be hit by the cross. <laughs> so go away. No, no, no. I mean, like, the good news is we've spread. I think there are now two or three people that understand how this works now. Um, so anyway, this, this completed, and if I do open um, docs underscore build um, HTML index.html, um, here's the documentation that I just built. So um, it builds in about a minute, um, which isn't bad for a thousand pages of documentation. So just a question on the, putting docs in the doc project versus in your, your project. Um, where should they go? They go in both places. Um, so historically speaking, we haven't had any support for putting it in your own project. Um, I think that's the direction we're going to move. Um, it's just that literally that was only a supported feature in the most recent release. And then as part of doing that feature, we had to do... Um, and, I, and I'll probably take other questions offline because I think I've already eaten five minutes the next people's time. Um, but um, uh, we basically migrated a thousand pages worth of ASCII doc content to restructured text. And to do that, we had automated tools that did it. Um, and so really there wasn't a way to then automatically push it out to all the projects easily. So we did it all in place because that was the old system. So, but I think in general over time, you're gonna expect that it's gonna drift to projects because that's the, where it belongs. <laughs> uh, and basically, I'd like to see that happen. So I think we're pushing there. Cool. And if there are any other questions, I'm around. Um, and um, uh, yeah, just find me and stable me to the floor for a while, because otherwise you won't get me.